when I was doing all these focus groups last year, one of the interesting things that came up all the time was people saying, like, Democrats or swing voters, not MAGA people, would say, yeah, you know what? We do need a wall. We need a wall around California. Stop all that crazy shit escaping and washing over the rest of the country. They see the, the same videos, right, of, like, the homeless people, like, walking around like zombies with machetes in their hands, and they think, want the, we don't want this everywhere. Yeah, this was happening yeah. in AI too. So it, it can happen again. That, that's the opportunity. It could happen. But, but the thing is that people, people either stay and they put down roots and they get woke or they make a pile of money and they leave. That's it. Like no one actually invests in San Francisco. That's the problem. In one sense, like you can't really get PR or a story stronger than what Hamas did. And to me, the actual interesting thing there is, right, that's like pretty much bad as it gets, right? It's like sort of filming the torture chambers of the NKVD and the Gestapo in Eastern Europe. But within like 10 days, it's basically um, uh, the NPCs in the media just go back to the script. Basically only knocks them off script for, you know, like a few news cycles, like maybe 10 days. It's funny, right before this, Dominic, I tweeted, I'm about to talk to Dominic Cummings, what should I ask? And someone actually chimed with some pretty good questions. So I was just reading those before. So I've, I've got some, some great follow-ups that I think we want your input on. Um, but yeah, on the right-wing, left-wing thing, um, I am a bit of a Fukuyama fanboy. Um, and I think he's, he's vast, not that I think you are, to be clear, but I think he's vastly misunderstood. People don't read through the 40 chapters of Reinterpreted Hegel. They barely even read past the title. It, and, his, and of course, the best chapter in that book is actually the last chapter <laughs> in which he actually pre he predicts a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, philosophical ennui and malaise that we currently see in the West. Right. And he actually predicted, in some sense, the rise of wokeness or sort of perverted liberalism that would turn out turning on itself. Um, you know, Fukuyama's yeah. point just. Yeah. Go well, ahead, yeah. Sort of it, it, he, he goes in, it goes in about that last chapter, which I agree with you, I think is the chapter of the book. He goes into some detail in, in, into Nietzsche's critique of modern liberalism, and um, and that is forgotten. You're right. In the, the way that people talk about that book, they always get the last chapter. Yeah, and, the, and just to summarize, there, I, I've done a whole piece on it, defending him actually in my in my Substack. That, you know, when he said the end of history, he didn't mean obviously that that things would stop happening in the world. What he meant is that the the arc of political evolution, however far back you want to draw it, from hunter gatherer tribes to the agricultural revolution, you know, middle age, the theocratic dynasties, the imperial age, nation, whatever, whatever that arc is, it kind of ends with liberal capitalism, right? Because the original Marxist idea, Marx originally predicted that communism would come after liberal capitalism had, had, yeah. had triumphed in a way to, to come up and divide the spoils and deal with the inevitable inequality that it dealt with. But the, the Fukuyama charge is like, no, 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 that's it. A, we're not, we're probably not going to regress to a darker age, although we might, but we're definitely not advancing into some sort of socialist utopia. Like this is as good as it gets. Liberal capitalism, end of story. That and and the Nietzschean angle, like he 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 quotes the spake our sister a lot, in which again to summarize very quickly what is a complex work, there were supposed to be these men with hollow chests who live at the end, who have given up the passions and the mad joys of tribalism, war, you know, pestilence, wars of ethno national you know ethno nationalist identity, which is funny to say in the context of Israel, which I want to get to, to, to as well. But in some sense, in that book, I think he actually explicitly says the European Union would be the final retirement home of the last men. Like that, the European project in some sense was the home of the last men. And yeah. in some sense, with the far right, you're seeing it's unwinding potentially. Exactly. And also with, you know, with, with the growth of Putin and, um, you know, the way that the EU, the, you know, the, in lots of ways, I think that's exactly right. And, and, and Brussels has tried to live out that role in many ways, right, over the last 10 years. I mean, uh, 15 years ago, when I would say to people, I used to live in Russia, I met people like Putin, he is not what you think. This whole idea that, like, he's some kind of, like, quite moderate reformer, and a technocrat, and uh, and Russia is going to join the EU in in you know in a few decades' time. This is all completely insane, and you're all going to get a terrible shock by this. And it was an incredibly at that time it was a very seems like a very, very extreme view. Even two or three years ago, you know, Britain and Europe were basically pretty happy with the status quo, in which London is the laundry for the Russian mafia. Uh, um, uh, Energy keeps flowing to, 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 to Germany very cheaply. Um, and we just kind of like draw a veil over a lot of the KGB oligarchs. 
behavior. People didn't want to face it. Do you remember when Trump came over and pointed out some of these things? It became a meme with everyone in the EU literally laughing at Trump about the, about the Nord Stream pipeline and warning, right? I mean, of course, like now nobody gives Trump any credit for being, for being uh, correct about it. Um, but that sort of shows the extent to which I think that, that Brussels just didn't want to face these kind of issues. It still doesn't. Okay, I've got a random question. It's a slight detour, Eric, but maybe you'll let me go crazy with the agenda. One conversation, speaking of the, the House of the Last Men, by the way, I love the House of the Last Men. Like the post history is actually pretty cozy. <laughs> I was in Lisbon recently and I was in Paris recently. My daughter is actually moving to France. She's a Franco, you know, she's a, she speaks French. She went to the DC here. I'd be, I'd love my child to grow up in Paris, right? And I think, you know, one of the debates that we have in the group is, you know, it, it's kind of around the spread of wokeness, the, you know, this whole, this whole business of things going squishy, a total dedication to equality, a fall in standards, like a lot of things are just kind of going soft. What I found interesting, for example, in the, again, to, I'm actually driving at a point here. In the case, of, for example, the Paris riots that happened this, this summer, that in its contours kind of felt a little bit like the BLM phenomenon in the United States, which, as you know, kind of in, in, the, in the COVID tizzy became like a whole thing, a whole moral panic that kind of seized the West. You saw yeah. it explode in the UK. I think the, the Anglo-Saxon English speaking world is definitely kind of a thing. And I think the UK hears the echoes very loudly of the American political zeitgeist. I think those echoes are heard much less loudly on the continent. And you saw what happened in Paris, that the legionnaires would show up and the riot police and they crushed it. And that was the end of it. <laughs> it did not extend from there. And I told the group, look, this Anglo-Protestant software does not run on Latin Catholic hardware. It's just not gonna, wokeness is not gonna spread to the continent in the way that you're expecting. Uh, like, I, is that true, or am I am I misreading things? Um, I mean, I think you've definitely got something of a point. Like, there's definitely a kind of common Anglo-American uh, uh, um, set of problems, partly connected with the fact that our, that that our universities and our media are much more similar. Right, the the media and Oxford and Harvard, BBC and the New York Times. There's just much, much more crossover than there is between either Britain and France or America and France. So I think to that extent, it's definitely true. On the other hand, of course, you know, there's many layers of irony in the whole thing, but it, to a very large extent, the kind of crazy philosophical origins of the whole, I don't even like using the word woke because I think it's a mistake, but that phenomenon, it is a, itself a product of continental philosophy, right, transported over to American universities post-war and growing, particularly in the 60s, and then infiltrating humanities departments and social science departments and, uh, uh, and everything else. Though, obviously, like the, the Alan Bloom's book, Closing American Mind, is, um, is partly a kind of trace of, the, of this intellectual current. So in that sense, I think that probably like, the long-term trajectory I think still similar in Europe and you can see it in Brussels. Um, you know, it's still following. We're all basically downstream of the, of the madness of San Francisco. Like it's different. In different <laughs> ways. But you're everywhere in Europe is downstream of, uh, uh, of San Francisco's insanity. It's just a question think, of, is, is that still true? Cause I, I think you're right, but the joke has always been in the United States that San Francisco is five years ahead of the U.S. And then whatever that madness is, is roughly five years ahead of Europe. I think the time scales have actually compressed. It's more like a year, but you still think it's downstream of, of the city oh. that I'm speaking to you from. Flesh yeah, that out. What does that mean exactly? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, that? The, you know, the, 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 the San Francisco is this, this kind of insane Petri dish of experimentation. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the Berkeley itself was like the, you know the, the, the kind of radical center of a lot of the of sort of 67 68 um, craziness right and, and and that kind of that impetus never died away it's kept pushing um, and these things just have a, have an incredible tendency to to, to, to wash east now if you'd said if you'd started to watch some of the, so let's take, for example, some of the crazy shit on um, trans, right? Now, if you'd said a few years ago, okay, there's like a full stack system in Northern California, uh, whereby kids are, um, are brainwashed into this crazy shit. And then there's actually like, you can go to Stanford Medical Center and they'll, and they'll start giving you surgery and start talking about taking out ovaries from 12 year olds and everything else. 
in Europe, they just said, this is completely insane. Like, that couldn't possibly happen. It actually sounds like child abuse. Ten years later, here we all are, right, with the, dealing with the same shit. So speaking of San Francisco, one topic I wanted to get to, we can, I guess we can just jump to it if we're following this, uh, this you know, bizarre sort of this, this tour. So it, we were talking recently, Dominic, or, or I know some of the people. So there's like an SF reform movement going on, right? There's some people I think that we all know. That, who, by the way, are, are very well respected in tech more broadly, like people like Gary Tan, who has made quite a name. He runs Y Combinator, which, speaking of influential organizations, hugely, I went through it myself, hugely influential organization. People like David Sachs, who was early on a PayPal, a bunch of companies, huge investor, are putting real money and time into trying to change the politics of San Francisco. I think yeah. San Francisco is exactly what you just said, which is the way I've dealt with it, having lived here off and on for almost two decades, is like, it's not really a city. Don't expect sane city behavior. It is a Petri dish in which we will say, oh, psychedelic drugs, game on. Or, oh, rule of law, who needs it? Defund the police. Oh, let's see what happens. Or, you know, autonomous vehicles, you know, what's going to happen, right? Yeah. That said, some people do care about it seriously, which I support, by the way. Um, and they definitely want to reform it and change it. And we were kind of studying the reasons as to why we think it was broken. I. I'll just toss a theory out there that you're free to disagree on and riff in another direction. But I think part of the problem with San Francisco is, is twofold. One, there's endemic corruption going back decades. I mean, going back to the gold rush days, it's always been just a pit of corruption at the city level. And it's no different now. It's just masquerading under progressive politics, in my opinion. There's a whole homeless industrial. SF has the second highest municipal budget in the United States. I think over $11 billion at this point. It's only a city of roughly seven to 800,000 people. It's not a very big city. It has the second biggest municipal budget in the United States after New York. Where does that money go? You, look, you walk around, it doesn't seem as if this is a well-funded city. It looks like a dystopia, frankly. I, it's funny, I retweeted a photo recently someone posted of an autonomous vehicle in front of a homeless guy stealing electricity to charge his laptop. And that's exactly literally what, like I've described it as autonomous vehicles navigating around homeless people. People think it's a joke, but that's literally what it is when you, when you walk outside. So yeah. it's a combination of, of corruption and I think the other thing is, and, and to, you know, give a little shade to the tech people, tech people fundamentally don't deeply care about politics. I think you have opinions on this. I think they just, you know, you go to a museum here and whoever funds it, funds it. But like, there's not a Google hospital or like a Facebook. I mean, Zuck gives a fair amount of money. You go to New York and even the biggest Wall Street asshole has endowed like a wing of, you know, Cornell Medical Center or whatever the latest exhibit is at the Met. In San Francisco, that's less so. People, t it's a gold rush town. People, the miners come in, they either make a fortune and stick around or move to Marin or they leave and that's it. No, no one's kind of from here and no one really invests in a deep way. Although to be clear, that's changing. People like Gary, I think are changing that. Anyhow, that's just all framing. What, what do you think it would take to, to fix San Francisco? And we can, can we maybe convince you to try to help fix it by coming to San Francisco? I mean, well, every, well, 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 what you say m makes sense to me, but, but, um, I guess like the, so the obvious question is like the people who are so obviously as, as crime gets worse, crime is obviously is, is, is often, often a very big issue in politics, right? And logic, I went to um, San Francisco earlier this year, like I turned the wrong corner and went down a street and then suddenly felt like I'd walked into like some kind of appalling apocalyptic video and literally had to run back down out of the street. <laughs> <laughs> literally like 90 seconds away, there was like people rolling around as if it's like perfectly normal. Right? It's just completely <laughs> I then went and spoke to some people that night. I had dinner in, in Palo Alto and they were like, fucking hell, like you were in San Francisco? Like I haven't been there in like four, four years. <laughs> I, mean, I think, I don't know, I live, in, I live in London and I think I visit San Francisco more often than a lot of people in Palo Alto, <laughs> right? Which maybe says something about, about uh, as you say, about the disconnection between the tech world and, and the city. But of the people who are left, what, what, so here's a question. Why, why hasn't independence, obviously the Republicans are completely doomed, but why haven't independence campaigning on crime and corruption been able to make any progress when it's, when it's, like, when it's a global punchline um, for like videos of apocalyptic dystopia? Hey. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat, outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? 
Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time. Plus, Shopify Magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash moment of zen. Go to shopify.com slash moment of zen now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash moment of zen. I think it's, so the first time I ever got dogpiled on Twitter was... I don't know how many years ago it was, I guess in 2015 or 16, when they passed this thing called Prop C that was a tax on gross revenues, which is nuts, particularly for tech businesses, um, to basically give more money to the homeless industrial complex, even though it wasn't working. And I think I, I calculated how much money we would raise, divided it by the number of homeless people and realized that it was as much money per homeless people as like the base salary as a Google engineer. <laughs> they were literally putting <laughs> plowing that much money. And I'm like, how is this possible? And I got totally dogpiled and ripped apart. Now, if you go and criticize the homeless industrial complex or even call it that, you don't get dogpiled. And in fact, there's a whole set of people who are, are there with you saying, yeah, we need to fix this. And so I think the, the vibe has definitely changed. There's been something like the recall of um, Chesa uh, Boudin, who was literally the son of communist cop killers. <laughs> like, it sounds like I'm making it up, but that actually, who worked for Chavez in Venezuela. <laughs> like, it sounds like a, like a punchline, but it's actually his biography. And he got yeah. elected district attorney, like the, pro, the equivalent of like the prosecutor, right? In San Francisco. <laughs> um, and then it was like so outrageous, he finally got kicked out. So I think some of that is happening. And that was a crime issue. That was literally, there is no law and order, get rid of this guy. Um, so yeah, that, that is, I think that is happening to a certain degree. I guess though that, so w w one thing that, um, that possibly behind it, I don't know, you tell me, is that I found, um, so when I wrote this thing in 2021 saying, um, like we're heading towards Biden, Trump too. Like everyone thinks the Trump's finished and it's not going to come back, but actually we're heading towards Biden, Trump too, unless Silicon Valley people decide to intervene and build alternatives. I spent some time talking to people there and the, and the, and, and the basic a problem that I had was people said, we largely agree with what you're saying and we largely agree that if it just ends up being as, as Trump, Biden too, that's obviously terrible. But, Precisely because politics has got so insane in the ways that you describe is exactly why it's totally impossible for me and my friends and other people here who've got anything to actually get involved with it. Because it would just be instantly completely destructive. And I'd, my family and my friends and my investors and my staff would all think I'd literally lost my fucking mind if I suddenly said, we're going to build an alternative to Biden. You know, we've got to do something different. So. It does seem to be this kind of catch-22, and, and, and it's a similar catch-22 in Britain, I think, that as, polit uh, as, the kind of, as establishment politics becomes more insane and the kind of communist mind virus expands and expands into the mainstream media as well, and they attack and try and destroy the lives and careers of anyone who gets involved with politics that doesn't share the kind of approach, then, it, then there is this paradox where able people, entrepreneurs, builders, people who could do it much better, want to more and more and are probably more inclined to get involved with politics in one sense than they were 10, 15 years ago, whether like politics is, you know, whatever, vote Obama and get on with building my, my trillion dollar company. Um, the, they're more inclined to get involved in one sense, but in another sense, the madness is like, it is just a, it's a greater and greater barrier. I don't know. Does that make sense? I, I, I think that makes sense. I think, yeah, I think the problem with techies is that 
not that they can't be political or be operators because they can, they end up having these large organizations, but I think a couple things, one, the whole techie vibe just gives a lot of mainstream normie voters the ick to use <laughs> zoomeries, which is like, it, it, it's just a different sort of vibe what it takes to make. I mean, look at Mark Zuckerberg, who, who I worked for. I was at, at Facebook 10 years ago on early member. I, I actually think very highly of him. And I said as much in my memoir, but you know, like, you know, that guy couldn't sell free beer. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's just one of those things. I mean, maybe now, um, Maybe, but he also pisses off a lot of people. Like we, we raised the question, like, could Elon run for mayor of San Francisco and win? And I'm not, I'm not sure he could actually, even among techies, he may not be able to win. He actually might have a better chance in like Reno, Nevada, that, it, you know, which is definitely more red than San Francisco than he would in San Francisco. Um, yeah, I mean, I think reason. Elon's a great example of, the, of this problem, right? Because you've got someone who was actually a hero to lots of people on the left, even just three to five years ago. He was very uh, explicitly and openly saying climate change is a big issue. And this is why we're going to do electric cars, and this is why we're going to do space exploration, and etc., etc., etc. And um, but even someone with the success that he had, and the kind of backstory of actually being on the side of the progressive, supposed like one of the top three biggest causes. As soon as he basically put a couple of feet out of line with the establishment view, um, they just immediately said, oh, you're a Nazi and we've got to start, you know, having the DOJ investigate you and maybe we should take all your shit and nationalize all your company. And that's, you know, I mean, I've had to say to me, Dom, you know, like if, 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 if Elon can go from being like global love figure to global hate figure in like 18 months, then imagine what they could do to me, right? And you're seeing it now as a, as a side thing. I mean, you know, relevant, uh, Elon just went to Israel and inside of Twitter, i.e. Jewish Twitter, it's a whole kerfuffle because a lot of sort of mainstream, bien pensant, liberal American Jews dislike Elon. One for like re replying snarkily to some vaguely anti-Semitic tweet maybe, and also just maintaining a Twitter platform in which, I mean, to be blunt, there are kind of open anti-Semites on Twitter now um, and they haven't been banned. Right, but he's definitely not, he's obviously not towing the party line when it comes to content moderation on Twitter. But this is a guy who, by the way, went to some of the places I went to actually and reported from for Tablet Magazine, like the actual kibbutzim right on the Gaza border. He was seen wearing body armor in one of them because it actually is dangerous down, like I was down there, it's a war zone. So the guy actually went there, expressed, sent, met with hostages, accepted a gift that I'm not taking it off till you get your hostages back, basically said, yeah, Hamas has to be destroyed. This is, this is unacceptable. And he's still, he's still, being pilloried as an anti-Semite because of his like content moderation policies on Twitter, which are definitely not the sort of, you know, the sort of policies that the left would want. It's just, it, it yeah, you're just shaking my head, <laughs> SMH yeah, I mean, to, I, to you. I don't really think it's to do with content moderation though. I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a much broader thing. He just, he signaled that he is not with the mainstream war, right? And the way that the Ukraine war Kind of um, coordinated uh, in a very, in a pretty unusual way, um, like establishment position, establishment politicians and media in Washington and London and across Europe very quickly, and anyone who stood out against that, I had I had the same thing here. Like I've been like I, I've been like the one one in a thousand or one in ten thousand anti-Putin for twenty years, regarded as madly extreme in my anti putinness right? Literally the whole thing just flipped because I said, I think this war is a fuck up. I don't think there's an actual strategy. It's going to end in tears. We're going to get bored and then have to banish it from the news. Well, you're obviously a paid Putin shill. You're a, a fascist apologist. You're an evil person. Like, the whole thing. So, I think he did, he, he bought Twitter. He said, I'm pro-free speech and he didn't tell the didn't toe the line on, on Ukraine, all in short order. And that was enough, it seemed to me. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Compliance doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, with Vanta, it can be super simple. Trusted by over 5,000 fast-growing companies like Chili Piper, Patch, Gusto, and Juniper, Vanta automates the pricey, time-consuming process of prepping for SOC 2, 
ISO 2701, HIPAA, and more. With Vanta, you can save up to 400 hours and 85% of costs. Vanta scales with your business, helping you successfully enter new markets, land bigger deals, and earn customer loyalty. And bonus, our Moment of Zen listeners get $1,000 off Vanta. Just go to vanta.com slash zen. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash Z-E-N. I wasn't, so Torenberg here is actually the son of an Israeli Jew and I converted actually, just so, so you know the company you're keeping here, Dominic. Um, uh, I went to Israel recently and, uh, you know, obviously I'm pretty public about being kind of pro-Israel and what they're doing in the war. W- one thing that people have commented on and I, and I tend to agree with it. Israeli PR is like terrible. Like they're mm-hmm. just not cracking the nut when it comes to the West. I have theories as to why, but before I contaminate the, the, the vibe, I'm curious if you agree with that. Um, what is your take on Israel? What is, your, what is your take on their PR strategy? Can they even win the PR war? Well, I think so. A, a, a few things, right? Ironically, like the whole kind of, you know, Russia was involved with Trump in 2016 story was obviously complete bullshit. Right. But... <laughs> There actually was a major KGB operation from the 1960s to try and shape Western perception about Israel in a negative way that was highly successful and uh, ended up uh, influencing all kinds of publications in the West, including publications read by people like Jeremy Corbyn, right? The guy who took over the Labour Party here, who's like crazy, extreme anti, uh, anti-Israel. So you have like long and almost became And almost became PM. To be clear, <laughs> yeah, he was within like twelve thousand votes. Twelve thousand votes distributed in different seats, and uh, and he would have been prime minister in twenty seventeen. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's those like very long term currents which have programmed the intelligentsia here for 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 decades in ways which I think are almost like not one in ten thousand people know the history of this and quite understand what the what, like how this actually worked. You also, though, have um, it's clear talking to people there that the you know Netanyahu does not have a grip of the like, the whole prime minister's office is chaotic. Prime minister's office does not coordinate well with Mossad and other parts of the deep state in Israel. So, like, there is no concerted proper messaging operation there either. Uh, so, I think in a kind of tactical operational sense, that's in, that's important. Um, but also, though, I think there's like a, a psychological problem, which is that. They keep. They think that. Um, they think. They, they make what well, I think is like a common problem, which is they think it's basically about facts. They think, oh, these. We watch this terrible news from the BBC or whatever, and um, these people don't know the truth. And if we explain the actual facts about Hamas and we explain blah blah blah, then it'll suddenly change somehow. And so they keep trying to hammer it with certain PR strategies at the Western media. But I think it's just fundamentally flawed because I don't think it's about facts. Like the, 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 the sad truth is that the BBC, like all the broadcasters, they have a long term moral, simple moral story about why Israel are, um, is an apartheid state and their occupiers. And everything, all information filters into this simple story and then filters out, right? And then, and that's it. It doesn't, it doesn't require, it doesn't work on the basis of facts. It doesn't work on the basis of reason. It doesn't work on the basis of logic. So I think any PR strategy which tries to combat it with facts and reason and logic is just, is doomed, right? It's like, um, it's a bit like in a way, like in a, sm- in a smaller scale, obviously, but just in terms of what you were saying before about, about Zuckerberg, when the first crazy Carol Cadwallader stories came out in 2016 about Russia and Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and all of that, Facebook sort of thought, well, this is all such obvious bullshit and like it doesn't reflect how digital advertising actually works. We'll explain some facts and then everyone will realize what the truth is. They didn't understand that they were actually caught up in a, in a, in a moral story, right? But the whole point was, evil tech companies have helped the evil fascists. So just explaining to the New York Times, guys, like your, your coverage doesn't actually understand what, how digital marketing works. And if we, you know, we'll explain to you how digital marketing works and then, you know, this terrible coverage will go away. 
who was Zuckerberg in Facebook, like clearly like, operated like this for like three years. And then in the end, they, why would we just keep getting fucked? They're like, what's going on here? But that's why, right? Because they're trying to deal with logic and facts about something that's not about logic and facts. Yeah, and I, I fell into that same trap. So my book came out in 2016, which is a memoir, which, you know, was a very kind of inside, <laughs> truthy, what's that? I read it. Great. Oh, did, oh, great. Oh, thank you. Great. Thanks. Yeah. And I, yeah, the, I actually met that Carol Calderwer figure once at some okay. festival and, and yeah, 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 yeah. And it's worth noting that in her career, career before being a journalist, I'm using air quotes for those listening to a podcast. Uh, she was a novelist, which I think is probably where her talent should have remained. Uh, Cause given every, literally everything she wrote about Facebook was completely fictional. Uh, but I yeah. also felt, Oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm going to explain how digital marketing works. Cause I've been on the inside. It got nowhere. It meant, it meant nothing. Everyone still thinks that the Russian influence campaign or that this Cambridge Analytica thing was real. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it was just hopeless at the end, <laughs> yeah. but, but getting back to Israel, like, I mean, I, one slight kind of argument is that like the videos that first came out of like the barbaric attacks did have some impact. Like there was a window of like one week of grace period in which, world opinion seem to be kind of pro-Israel, as you saw literally the most barbaric and heinous atrocities being committed, like li literally live streamed by the, by the yeah. people actually committing it. Um, and I think, you know, I, I saw the famous 46 minute video that's even like more gory of, of what Hamas did, as did Douglas Murray and other journalists, and they've reacted very strongly to it. I included it in my piece and tablet about what's going on there. So <clears throat> to some degree, I think, and, and to, I think truth does help, but getting back to like, you're right. It doesn't fit into the narrative. Like this poster business, which has driven me crazy, right? This business of ripping down. I've put oh, yeah. kidnapped posters. Wait, wait. Just, just on that point, because I think that's an important thing, right? In one sense, like you can't really get PR or a story stronger than what Hamas did. And to me, the actual interesting thing there is, right, that's like pretty much bad as it gets, right? It's like sort of filming the torture chambers of the NKVD and the Gestapo in Eastern Europe. But within like 10 days, it's basically um, uh, the NPCs in the media just go back to the script. Right. So even right, some, yeah. as mentally appalling as that and as powerful as that, basically only knocks them off script for, you know, like a few news cycles, like maybe 10 days. And then they're back to, oh, Israel's destroyed a hospital in Gaza. I know. Right. It's crazy. It's like, imagine the Nazis had like live streamed Auschwitz. And then like two weeks later, people were like, well, I don't know. Were they really shoved in ovens? Did this it's, expert of life? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Exactly. I don't know that they know the dead German civilian count is higher than the British one. I think we should have a ceasefire. That's clearly what we should do now. That was clearly the tenor of the conversation in 1943 at uh, 10 Downing. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, but yeah, and that, I mean, yeah. But, I, I, yeah. It, it seemed to me like the, like the people in Israel doing the communications understand this. Right? I feel so sorry for them because watching them, it looked like, it looks increasingly like, come on, like does, the world sort of knows what Hamas did, right? But it seems like we can't get traction with this. So like keep repeating it or, and they seem to be like increasingly lost as, as, they're, as they're starting to realize like global opinion and the global media yeah. is away from them on the story, but they don't have like a follow-up plan. No, I, I think, so, you know, I, I've got lots of Israeli friends. I have Israeli business partners. I was there for a while. Um, who knows? I may move there one of these days. I think the problem with Israel, and I said this in my piece, is like the Israelis, Israel is a fascinating country with a fascinating people. They don't realize how weird they are, right? Like they're, they're obviously very assimilated to like global American, Anglo, whatever, Western business culture. They've obviously been very, very, very successful as an economy, GDP per capita matching Germany and the UK's, which is more than 10x higher than any neighboring country. It's like they're very good at playing the Western game, but the internal Israeli nation narrative is completely unlike the West right now, to the point that like, one of the questions I got from a friend of mine is like, how is it that the Western left is lining up with a theocratic death cult instead of like the Israeli left, which is actually super commie, by the way. And it's funny, like all these kibbutz that were attacked by Hamas, like European press is calling them settlements. It's like, do you have any idea what you're talking about? This is literally the lefty tree hugging peaceniks who live in literal communism, <laughs> where they literally <laughs> split up the income and live in the only functioning communism one can find in the West. That's who yeah. got attacked. That's who you're calling settlers and, 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 and painting as the right. But that's the thing. I think the Israelis, 
how are they going to sell the story? They're a religious ethno state. Like, <laughs> how does that square with a Western narrative in which, oh, no, it's borderless, it's universalist, anybody can be Norwegian, right? Like this business of the, uh, you know, the Irish, the Algerian or whatever it was immigrant who like stabbed the kid in Ireland that they kept on saying, no, 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 it's, it's an Irishman. It's like, no, it isn't. And the fact he isn't is somewhat material to the story, but you can't accept the fact that, in fact, not everybody can become an Irishman or whatever. And that's, that's the collision. Like, I'm not sure that Israel can be sold. And at some point, like my advice to them would like win the war and just, it doesn't matter what the West says. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, you can see the kind of madness of the West, right? I mean, the, 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 the most, the most perfect example of it is the way that the most insane trans right activist propaganda people have kind of joined forces with Hamas, right? Like the first people who are all getting thrown off the roof stat of the ones who are like mobilizing most aggressively on behalf of Hamas and Hezbollah, right? <laughs> I understand the madness of Western Union. I mean, to be fair to the Israelis, it is pretty tough to understand that, right? I mean, it's like, you know, joke is it's like chickens organizing for KFC. It's like, I, do you understand what the nature of the thing you're talking about is? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe switching topics slightly to one of the questions and one of the things that came up in our group. Um, so, you know, Dominic, you, you know, particularly in Britain, where things are pretty classes still, at least as far as I understand, I actually don't know the UK deeply well. I've lived in Spain and France, but I don't know the UK well. But, but you have hovered in elite circles, and I've kind of dabbled, I mean, in tech, right? Well, this is the real core of the question. What is an elite? What is the new elitism that's coming? There's a lot of people that I think we all know who are from those elite circles, are very financially uh, capable and endowed and privileged and all that, and they're not going to send their kids to university. Right. Like they're just not going to go the Harvard Cambridge route or whatever that is. But they don't yeah. they don't have an alternative. Like they don't know what well, what's the other thing. So is there a new elite coming? Does there need to be a new elite? Like what what's your read on all that? I mean, you have kids, I assume. So this is like a real question for you. I mean, a lot, a lot of different questions bound up in that. I do think that um, like, well, so one of the things you alluded to, uh, 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 I think, is very interesting about this, about this question. Like, are, are we going to send our. Uh, like I've got a seven-year-old, a seven-year-old kid. Um, you know, ten years ago, I would probably not really have even reflected on it much, but just would have assumed that obviously, like I wanted to do certain kind of school, and then you know, ideally get into one of the top universities in the Western world, and I wouldn't have probably reflected on it much. Whereas now, um, I think, uh, or, like, almost exactly the opposite. Like I think like maybe in maybe in like ten, twelve years, like if he really wants to do maths and he's really good at maths, then maybe he should still go to Cambridge or Harvard if he can get into one of those two places. But barring that, uh, um, it seems to me like, like less likely with every day that, um, that that that's something that I would want him to go and spend his time in. Quite the opposite. Um, so I do think that's a big issue. Uh, I, I hope that some of the rich people do what their um, forefathers did uh, and actually go out and start new things. I also hope, um, it also strikes me that maybe there's an opportunity to kind of jailbreak the maths and physics departments because a lot of the credibility of these universities right, doesn't anymore come from the history department and the English department and whatnot, which have all just been taken over by 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 insane forces the credibility that they have left really comes from what they do in hard sciences so maybe um you know one one thing i've been talking to some people about is the idea of could you say uh right we're going to set up something um and offer faculty for maths physics maybe computer science and say you only have to move like half a mile away um uh, for work you don't have to move your family but you can shift to the, a new institute, which we're going to run. It's going to be run in the following ways. There's going to be actual academic freedom. All of the crazy communist shit is going to be completely forbidden. None of it's going to exist. Um, and here's the kind of principles on which it will operate. You'll get more money. You'll get more freedom. You'll be able to move much faster. You know, if, like, if you're a professor of physics now at Oxford, the amount that you can actually do in any kind of time frame is like almost zero because the, the, the bureaucracy is so completely insane. So I think 
there are there are possibilities like that maybe for for creating different um for creating different institutions it doesn't strike me as likely that in like 30 years time um uh the smartest kids are all going to be keeping going to these universities and they're going to be you know as mad as they are now politically so something's going to something's going to change there either they're going to break up and fracture or people are going to create new things and pull away high status people um and and, and, and it'll change like that um and obviously um yeah so on, 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 the, on the university front i think that's but Politically, though, the fundamental question is, I think, goes back to what we were talking about before. We've, you know, we've, we've seen in the Western world this very big shift in elite talent where, um, you know, 50 years ago or 70 years ago, a huge number of the most able, smartest people that could actually build things, the General Groves characters, um, uh, people who built Bletchley in Britain, right, these people have very largely stopped going into public service. So if you go to the, the caliber of top civil servants now in, in Britain uh, and in Washington, is drastically lower. And more and more of the, of the most able people are in some combination of maths, money, computers, DC, hedge funds, um, startup world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that obviously has all kinds of advantages from an economic perspective, but I think it's also disastrous from a government perspective. And some of these people are going to need to have to get, are going to, have to move back into politics. I think if it's going to change, we can't just have all of our great builders operating as entrepreneurs in private companies, whilst um, you know the CIA and the NSA and White House institutions just keep decaying and, and are less and less able to cope with with problems but then the, the, the right but then the question becomes do you sort of revitalize existing institutions or do you create new ones um at the end of the i day? mean i'm very strongly in the camp i mean having 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 done both in government i very strongly think that um the startup model is the way that, that, that to, to, to go in government like if you're going to try if, if your goal is if you, so if you're the new president, you take over January 2025, and by 2030, 2035, you want a drastically reformed American military, do you, A, try to do some kind of conventional reform project in the Pentagon, or B, set up new institutions that will just tunnel around the bureaucracy, empowered in different ways, legally set up in different ways, with completely different freedoms over HR, over freedom of information, over procurement, over you know all of the bullshit which makes it just impossible to do it. And it's obvious that you do B, right? You don't say to the US Air Force. Um, I mean, I've, so I'll give you like a classic example that I've actually had experience with in government. What do you do with future planes? Well, of course, the existing RAF in Britain doesn't want to do drones. Because the whole institutional structure and the whole way you get promoted is by being in charge of pilots. So the system fights against all, uh, against actually shifting to modern technology. So instead of trying to convince this old bureaucracy to do the new thing, you just set up, a, you set up the drone force, right? You don't try and make the old thing do the new thing. You set up the new thing and you just shift money and power towards the new thing. Um, you know, it is possible to reform things, uh, and I've reformed some things. I spent a lot of time in the Department of Education changing things, but it's incredibly hard. It's incredibly slow. Um, the forces against you are so massive, and you've got to kind of get everything aligned just right. It's it's just much simpler to 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 to, to do startups in government than it is to to. Um, you know, I, I'll give you a practical example of that as well. So we set up a, a new data science and AI team in number 10. Because it was new, it was actually much easier to create. It seemed much less threatening. Um, it didn't seem like, it, like this terrible challenge to existing power structures, the way that telling a lot of existing things that they had to change would have been. Uh, of course, now it's actually successful and it's doing all sorts of things. Of course, part of the system are desperately trying to close it and destroy it because it's, it shows everyone up and it's super powerful the old parts of the system but it certainly was much easier to get that built than it was to 
you know, persuade thousands of people to change. What if you're trying to become president um, in the first place? You, you talk about, you know, if you do become president, but if you're trying to win in the first place, do you try to take over the left? Do you, uh, the Democratic Party, do you try to take over the Republican Party? Do you start a new party? How, have you, how would you think about that? I know you're interested in America 2024. Um, t- talk, talk a bit about that. I mean, I think practically speaking now in the States, like the, 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 I think the, the die is cast on the Republican side, right? Like Trump is going to win the nomination now. It seems like a lot of donors are, are going to throw a lot of money down the toilet trying to back um, Haley. I think um, like she can't, there's no campaign that she can run that can win. Like possibly Trump can blow himself up. Um, uh, but uh, she she got I think that's doomed. Like the time to do that, as I said in twenty twenty one, was then, um, and 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 they've left all that too late. Um, I do think it's underrated with Biden that uh, the kind of assumption seems to be that you know he wants to do it, therefore he'll just keep doing it. I think an underrated scenario is that he just takes like another mental dip, and the polls blip down enough that it's just clear that Trump is going to win the the Electoral College. And all the focus group reports start pinging back up through the system from the five, six key states saying, yeah, does all the swing voters say that Biden doesn't mean Biden? Biden means either a senile Biden, Gaga Biden, they can't actually be president, or it's going to be President Kamala. And we'd rather have Trump than President Kamala. So fuck it, we're going to go for Trump. And as those focus group reports come back up, you can imagine panic. Democratic Party and they shove him out. So I do think it's underrated that Biden could still get the, the that he could get pushed out. Um, I mean, in terms of setting up a new party, so I did some focus group and, and polling research on this um, last year in the states, and it was we, we hit a kind of interesting problem, like figuring out what a new party should say and do to be very popular was not so hard, right? Which is generally a lesson of electoral politics. If you actually just listen and you want to figure it out, there's, there's usually a way. The problem that we found was that people said, yeah, God, we hate the old parties. It's crazy that they're so shit. It's crazy that they won't change and listen to us. Yes, I want a third party, but I probably wouldn't vote for it. And you go, but why not? Like, you literally just said all these things, and now we've given you the third party. Here's our policy. We've designed it. We've got your theoretical leader that you like. But then, what, like, why are you not going to vote for it? And they go, well, because we're just going to be a waste of vote, and the crazy people on the other side will get in, and, like, the whole thing, the country's destroyed. So they kind of, that first past the post problem, I think, is a, is a, is a real problem. And I think, realistically, you like it's, so therefore, like getting over that, it's either a very long process that you have to resign yourself, might take 20, 30 years of building, or you need a kind of global superstar. You need an Elon type person or a Kanye type person, someone of someone of that level of global fame that just like instantly punches through all media. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, let's say it wasn't too late. It was like a couple of years ago and someone like Elon had come to you and said, hey, you know, I want to run. I want. I want to compete. What are sort of the core issues, or what what is the platform that would that would uh, that would be able to compete? That would that would most widely resonate. I think you talked about this a little bit in your podcast with Andrew Sullivan. Um, uh, Why don't you un- unpack that a little bit? Um. Well, I guess so. I, so one issue is really simple, right? And, and kind of shows the problem. If you if you just do regular focus groups with people and you chat around. Uh, uh, um, what sort of things that people people want? One of the first things that people will spontaneously say is term limits. We've got all of these old people. We've got these like senile people in both parties everywhere. It's it's an it's a, it's an embarrassment for us on the world stage. We've got to have term limits and drive these old people out and get new talent in. And also, we just not just old people. We just don't want the same people there all the time. And it cuts completely across party support. You can. AOC fans support it. Trump fans, Magus, the most Magus support it. It's like a total home run. But why do no? But, but the old parties can't support it, right? Because the old parties are locked into a system where if you say that, that's like that's like calling for like everybody in Congress to to, to be you know investigated by the IRS or something, right? <laughs> it's like it's declaring war on the system. But if you're going to be a third party, you didn't care about that, and you prepared to take risks, and and you and you were just openly at war with the system anyway. 
then um, you'd have a bunch of things like term limits, like much stricter controls on Congress, um, all of their dodgy share dealing, you know, buying stocks and shares and inside trading, all that kind of crazy shit. You'd have a whole set of things like that. Um, I think you'd be uh, you'd be very tough on the border, very tough on crime. Like you'd be much t- closer to Trump on that, and it's all constantly interest. Like the Democrats are just out of touch. They're out of touch with a lot of their own voters on that. Like I can't remember now when I did all this research. It was last year, and I can't remember the exact numbers. But you know, there's a good chunk of Democrats who uh, um, who voted Biden in 2020 who basically agree with Trump on police, the border, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think you'd be crazy to do a lot of what the Republicans try and do constantly, fighting on social security and, and um, destroying Obamacare. Again, I would, I, on everything like that, um, on, on, um, trying to like ha- have some kind of big argument about the overall structure of the healthcare system is just doomed. I've, I, I've run a whole bunch of focus groups on that. There's no way through. There is no like great new universal plan that people go, oh yeah, okay, this guy's cracked it, and this is what we should do. So I think definitely you definitely avo- um, you definitely avoid that. Um, but I think a, a bit like a bit like um, what we did in 2016 and 2019, right? We got attacked by the media constantly as being completely incoherent. Uh, um, and it was because our agenda didn't fit neatly onto the existing party axis and it didn't fit onto a left-right thing. So we were much tougher on immigration than the Conservatives were, but we were actually in the same place as the country was. Like, we were with the median voter. We were um, to the left, so to speak, of the Conservative Party on um, healthcare, but we were exactly where the median voter was. Now, in Westminster, all the media say, oh, your policy is incoherent, no one will pay attention to that, it doesn't make any sense. But that's not how voters think. So, again, if you're constructing, if you're constructing a party in the States and you just were optimising for winning, right? not whether or not the pundits say you're smart or whether your strategy makes sense, if you're just optimised for winning, it's, it's definitely going to look a bit odd like that. It won't fit into the conventional party structure. It won't fit on a left-right axis. And that's partly because, you know, in a sort of crude caricature terms, if you if you do focus groups and research on swing voters, whether it's in California or, or Pennsylvania or in Britain, they're kind of national socialist, right? They are they they are far to the right of most elected representatives on many issues, and and to the left of them on many issues at the same time, the same person. And this is com- constantly, I think, like underrated and, and not. Um, you know, so the whole political punditry world works constantly on this idea of the center ground, which is regarded as this kind of average of left and right. Oh, there's balloons coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this idea of the center ground, where, they, where where people are kind of average of left and right, and it's just it. All pundits basically believe it, and there's endless. Everyone writes about it in every election, but it just doesn't actually map to the data of how how real voters. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I agree with you, right? Like, it's funny. One of the catchphrases you see of San Francisco, your average San Francisco guy is like, "I'm socially liberal but fiscally conservative." And it's like, actually, most Americans are fiscally liberal and socially conservative. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you're, yeah. it's you. I mean, that that is an elite view, but most Americans are actually not like that. They're actually socialist to the core. And the government better not touch my medical care, but they're actually to the right on a bunch of other issues. Exactly. One thing I'd, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd push back on it because I suspect that party would actually still win. But one thing I've noticed, again, the EU-US difference in the EU, however, and again, I mean the, the continent for the most part, how, however broken any political process might be, it does seem like things kind of converge if there is a majority view. And to use one particularly hot button issue, but it's, it's a good issue because it's very parametrized abortion, right? Abortion is actually not a binary thing. The real debate is actually at what is the what is the cutoff at which abortion happens? And if you look at most polling in the United States, it's almost exactly where the law dictates in most European, again, I'm not sure what the law is in the UK, but in Germany, France, and Spain, it's basically anywhere between 11 to 13 weeks is the upper bound for abortion. That tends to be where, where people poll at. 
most people don't want a total ban. Most people don't want an abortion literally two seconds before the child is born. And most yeah. people land in that 13 to 15. And, and, and Americans are the same way, by the way. And, and yet the narrative in the United States is either fully ban, no way, like the, the Catholic party line, or it's the liberal line, which is any encroachment to abortion is unthinkable. Never mind that like when DeSantis, for example, I think in his initial platform, he had a 15 week limit, which is more permissive than most European countries. And most yeah. American liberals like didn't even seem to understand that actually Florida abortion law would be more to the left than France's would. <laughs> But it didn't matter, right? But in the U.S., thing, and, it, and I could cite examples when it comes to, to gun laws, to a bunch of other things, where, in fact, most Americans are not crazy, I need to own a tank, gun nuts, nor total banners, or somewhere in the middle. And yet in yep. Europe, policy tends to converge to the democratic mean, but in the U.S., actually, it doesn't. It actually pins to the extremes. And I don't know if that's because of primarying, first past the post voting, or what, but it, things seem to be different. Yeah. Because, of the, because of the primary problem. Become the primary, yeah. yeah on certain things like abortion because as you say it's um i mean so again i, I looked at this issue last um uh uh last year um and you can see like how you could craft a policy on abortion which would basically be like reasonably popular with people but it would be attacked um whether you're a republican or democrat you'd be massively attacked by the people on your own side for for proposing if you actually crafted the, the like the optimal strategy on abortion for a presidential candidate, as soon as you said it, you would be attacked, whether you're Republican or Democrat, by by your own side as like a, 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 as, as a massive traitor. But I've got a theory on this. Like, it's not inconceivable to me that Trump might actually go into the next into by like September October 2024. Trump may have a more popular policy on uh, like be closer to the median voter. And have uh, a, a more popular policy on abortion than than Biden, because if you look at his history, he was never a kind of um, very far right on this issue. Right? He's from New York, he, um, so it's possible. Uh, certainly, if you listen to the polls, he will do. But it would be a very interesting move for him suddenly to shift. Um, and and. Here's an, here's an alternative like way of how these of how abortion works. Right during the 2020 election campaign, Biden actually shifted from a more popular policy on abortion to a less popular policy on abortion. Why did that shift happen? It happened because the staff in his own campaign revolted and basically demanded of him that he change policy, and he didn't feel strong enough at that moment in the campaign when he was still weak to push back against his own staff. And that shows like another dynamic of this, right? The Democrats are so taken over by very young, very elite, university-educated staff that they constantly push their own campaigns to positions which are completely irrational if you're actually trying to optimize for winning. You know, can you see this? I mean, there's all sorts of vapor out on this, right? In 2016, something like a third of the ads that Hillary ran actually helped Trump. And the ads which were most popular with Democrat activists and donors and got most clicks with them were the most helpful towards Trump, right? This is like a crazy thing, which doesn't fit with the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is, okay, politicians may be shit at government, but they are at least trying to win elections. That is not true. It's almost never true. Politicians generally are optimizing for much shorter term things. They're optimizing for internal kind of in-group dynamics in their factions and signaling to the media over like a 48-hour window. That's most of what their activity is. And that's what explains this constant weird stuff of why, why are politicians not actually adopting the optimal strategy, which is, doesn't is make that, any basic democratic theory. But is that unique to the U.S.? Because, like, again, in the EU, just, just to cite the European oh. example, things have kind of converged to the public will. In the U.S., they haven't. Um. No, I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's. Why I think it's. I think it's widespread across across democratic. I guess across democratic politics. I think America is a bit odder because of the primary thing, but um, Britain has definitely been the same. You know, I've watched elections here, twenty years. Um, uh, uh, certainly since twenty ten, the only election campaign that was actually rational was our campaign in twenty nineteen. It's just, uh, apart from that, both sides constantly run 
um, run election messages, which are just uh, which clearly don't work. And another example of it, right, is in the referendum. Our strategy was hated by all of the MPs and um, the most kind of committed activists on our own side. Because these people, they don't really want to listen to the public. What they want to do is, is tell the public what they should believe. And they constantly think, well, if you just shout louder at them and tell them more, then the public's finally going to go, oh, all right, OK, well, I agree with you. OK, right. Which is not how things usually work. But they hate listening. People in politics hate listening. Can I, can I bring up one last thing? Speaking of alternatives to democracy, one topic that came up in, in our group chat this morning, um, I believe uh, a venture capitalist we both know, Dominic, um, was hanging around with uh, King Charles. He's king now, right? I, part of my privilege as being an American is not thinking about royals, which is what spurred the debate. Uh, he felt that the British, the British monarchy has a certain gravitas and a certain social function to play um, as head of state. Uh, I think it's a ridiculous atavistic throwback to a barbaric age that should be done away with. Um, I think one of the most ridiculous things about the Australians and the Canadians is that they still have a foreign monarch on their coin. Unlike us crazy Americans, gun nuts though we are, we have no foreign monarch on our coins. Thank you very much. Um, and in fact, my, my right as an American is not thinking about which royal waste rule popped out of which royal vagina. I don't even have to think about this crap. Um, and I think that in fact, if there is a liberal Democrat, I mean, I think that the role of head of state though is important. And one thing that actually the Westminster, not the Westminster system, I guess, but other parliamentary systems have is they have a head of state that's different than the head of government, right? Like in Israel, for example, um, you know, you, you've got Herz, Isaac Herzog, who's the head of state who meets with Douglas Murray and the hostages and kind of represents the people. And then you've got the head of government, who everyone hates, of course, because the head of government's always hated, who actually operationally runs things. And um, if there's one thing the American political system gets wrong is the head of government and the head of state are basically the same person, which is why national politics are basically symbolic religious wars when really it should be about who's the best CEO. But in any case, that's a, that's a long wind up. But what do you think of the royals, Dominic? Are they worth keeping around? Um, I mean, obviously the thing is ridiculous in lots of ways, but I think you're being too rationalist, Antonio. I think you're thinking <laughs> that, well, it's this weird throwback and it doesn't really make any sense and they all have these weird outfits and how can this possibly be a, a rational way of looking at it but um i would say like rational, rationalism in european politics is uh, has often been the path to catastrophe um the keep royal family makes no logical sense but i would actually be in favor of keeping it and i think that um i've got two basic two basic things one is that i think from a practical point of view if it was replaced it's almost inconceivable that what replaced it would be an improvement in my for, for, in my eyes and secondly something that i've noticed which i think is, is important very hard to quantify is i think it i think it's it, it's a kind of um it's a last defense against extremism slash fascism slash communist takeover. And the reason for that is that um, the armed forces don't swear an oath to the government. They swear an oath to, uh, well, they did swear an oath to the queen. Now obviously they swear an oath to the king. And I think that has an oddly stabilizing effect like you can imagine all kinds of political disasters, or you can imagine the kind of political disasters you often see in countries happening. If you imagine similar things happening in Britain, because it distributes power in this way, it would be much harder for some kind of like extremist fanatic government to take over and actually take over the entire state and take over the armed forces and have some kind of Stalinist coup. Do you know what I mean? Because the armed forces, other parts of the state, there's this like residual feeling of, oh, you're actually basically like some kind of like foreign inspired coup and we're just not going to do what you say. Yeah, and, that, and that's literally happened. So in 1981, uh, there was a, a coup, a, a coup attempt in Spain, actually, in which the Guardia Civil, which is like the, the, the paramilitary, like the, the militarized police, literally stormed the parliament. <laughs> and there's a, a photo of uh, uh, Coronel Tejero, like wavering on a pistol and giving a lecture in front of the uh, the uh, in the Chamber of Deputies in Spain. And what happened? Uh, King Juan Carlos II of Spain basically got on TV in his uniform 
with the flag behind him and said, yeah, we're not going back to fascism. Like, this is not going to happen. And basically called up every general and said, all right, pick a side, bro, me or jail. And everyone said, okay, 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 everyone come down. Like, and then they arrested the, the coup leaders and like, that was the end of it. And so in fact, it worked exactly as you said, right? The embodiment, the spirit of the nation kind of arose and said, no, we're not doing this crazy shit. Everyone go back to your room. Exactly. But if, you, if, you, if someone tried to do that in Britain and then uh, because of this diffuse authority, you know, it is sort of slightly weird. Like, you know, you sit in number 10 and you, the prime minister says, OK, we're going to do this or, you know, sending special forces somewhere or we're going to do this with whatever. The actual like the, ac- the actual formal powers in lots of ways are not his. He is acting on behalf of the queen. And it does have a weird effect. And it, and it, and it does mean that these people would not, you know, if, if it suddenly went crazy, or um, or there was some kind of like you know weird person managed to take like a Hitler style situation right where someone actually wins an election, becomes head of state, in all kinds of rationalist European constitutions. Well, the whole system now reports up to them, including the armed forces and the, the new person who's won the vote. Well, everyone just has to do what they say, sort of thing. That doesn't happen in in the, in the weird, archaic, irrational British constitution. But I think the little bit of friction and absurdity in it is like a good, good long term hedge. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's like the Second Amendment in the United States. <laughs> Worst comes to worse. Everyone's got their rifle. But yeah, I'm trying to think in the US who occupies that role of like sanity check. It really is the Constitution, right? The US Constitution is the symbolic thing that embodies the nation. But of course, that's a text subject to interpretation, which is why the Supreme Court almost acts like a rabbinical court, you know, interpreting. The, the Torah or something, right? And so the U.S. is kind of a religious project. But yeah, in the U.S., there is no embodiment of the nation outside of the, the Constitution in a way. That's, that's all you've got. About going too far in some ways, isn't there? Like, I, I always find it interesting how um, if you take like a, quite an extreme situation in American politics of Roosevelt in the 30s, after his second win, when he was really like, I can't remember exactly what the majority was that they had in Congress, but it was extraordinarily massive, right? And he got a massive landslide. And he could really, he could and was completely ripping up Washington, closing things down, reopening things, doing all kinds of stuff. But he then made a move on the Supreme Court and he basically had to back off. It was seen as like just a step too far. That's a good good example. That's right. He tried packing the court famously, by which meaning putting his cronies in and basically interpreting, you know, like the... My, my poli-sci professor in high school said, what is the U.S. Constitution? Whatever nine justices say it is. <laughs> and so if you control yeah. the justices, you control the Constitution. And that, that, in fact, was a step too far. I mean, that was like, that would be like imprisoning the queen. That's it. You've lost everybody. Nobody's going to follow you there, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. We, we, we've well, been I, talking. I, oh, go for it, Antonio. Uh, no, I've, I'm just saying I, I've harassed Dominic with all my, okay, ask the smartest bird I know questions. <laughs> so... <laughs> Dominic, you got them all. Um, I, I've got a couple more, and then we'll, we'll get Dominic okay, out of here. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, one, so some people use the mental model of thinking about the the left in the U.S. as you know, co- college educated people, one third of the country, plus um, you know, certain you know, a large percentage of certain minority groups that those college educated people claim to speak on behalf of and and prioritize and and give deference to uh, against on the right, non educated. Uh, or non-college educated, um, working class white people. And that's a crude, you know, summarization, but it's um, a way of kind of describing the, the differences and, and the tensions that emerge where sort of one third of the, the country uh, sort of speaks for, two, for, for the rest of the country in terms of dominating the institutions um, that, that govern the, the rest of the country. And thus there's sort of this populist uh, outrage that, that has the numbers, um, but doesn't have the power and thus uh, elects someone like Trump. How would you edit that that characterization in the U.S.? And I'm curious if that same sort of cleaving or something similar to that is what's also happening in other countries where we're seeing um, sort of similar figures like Trump, or is is it all very very different? No, I mean I think so. There's definitely something common across the Western world in terms of what's happening with educational polarization. Right, you can see in the data in every country. The story is is sort of similar since since 1945. Graduates used to be much more conservative, um, uh, uh, and and uh, and that shifted dramatically. Um, I mean, sorry, it shifted gradually. 
for decades, and then it's really kind of become turbocharged in the last uh, in the last 10, 10 20 years. Um, and that's definitely thrown politics. Uh, 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 it's definitely confused all of the old system, right? They don't they they haven't quite understood it. And it's part of the reason why they didn't see Brexit coming and didn't see Trump coming. I mean, just in like one interesting way, before Brexit, most of the polling companies didn't wait by education, certainly in Britain. And I think similar problems happened with the polling in, in, in America. Um, they just didn't... Like, so our data science team looked at all of these polls in 2015, 2016, and they said, you know, like... The data that we've got is not being is not reflected in the mainstream polls. And the fundamental reason is that they don't understand what's happening with education and polarization. And very similar thing happened, I think, um, uh, with, with Trump. So there's no doubt that establishment parties have been caught on the on 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 the back foot by that. I'd like to ask one more question, since um, getting to this issue of. Um you know, education and, the, and left versus right. I mean, it, I forgot who I read. It was probably Tyler Cohen or somebody. And he mentioned how in the 1950s, if you told somebody you were Democratic or Republican, or to use a slightly more wonky term, if it was the input to your, you know, re your logistic regression model that tried to classify various parts of your lifestyle, being Republican or Democrat wouldn't have told you whether you owned a firearm, went hunting, had a college education. It wouldn't have told you lots of things, actually. And while mm -hmm. now it's almost this positive, <laughs> right? Literally, it is like a 90-10 split either way for every question I just said whether you're a Republican, Democrat, whether you own a gun, went to college, et cetera. And so there's just a massive split of just beyond politics. I mean, in the U.S., it really is a, a red versus blue tribe sort of issue. Um, and I'm not even sure what, why that is. And I've lived in red states and I'd, I'd be a hard nut to crack if, if you tried based on politics, you know, whether I own a gun or not or whether I have a college education. But like broadly speaking, like why is it here, – here's a better question. Why does the right kind of suck in the sense that like when it comes to like aesthetics, when it comes to education – I mean, I think it was David Rebnick who famously called Trump a short-fingered vulgarian, which he kind of is. And, you know, he said many things that were true, right? Like his, his critique of Russia during 2016 was actually correct. And so not to say that everything Trump said was, was nonsense, but there's, there's an air about him. When he has a rally, it's like the pillow guy that shows up. It's like people that you wouldn't want your sister to date or, you know, media or culture that you yourself wouldn't consume or identify with. And yet you're kind of stuck, right? Because on the one hand, like... Let's face it, anyone with any level of IQ, education, elite status, income is like shopping at Whole Foods and living in one of six cities and that's their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And yet, if, if you kind of reject whole hog, the, woke, the far left agenda, well, what do you do? Are you going to go live in Nashville? Like, no. <laughs> that said, this is someone who's lived in Reno and rural Washington. So I, I have made that jump, but broadly speaking, it's, most people are not going to do that. It, it, feels so like why, the, it feels like the midwit meme, right? Whereas the, the right, you know, both has sort of the, the, the hick, but also Peter Thiel and sort of the, the new counter elite or sort of the true intellectual. Yeah, but the, but the Peter Thiels are the, are the minority, right? At the end of the day, that's not, that's not, you know, if you, it, would a guy from San Francisco, even if he had some Trump sympathy, if they went to a Trump rally, would they look around and say, oh yeah, we, I have a deep sympathy with these people? No, he wouldn't. <laughs> He'd right. walk right out of there. And so what do you do with that, right? If you're not going away, you're not going with the far left agenda and yet you're, you know. The, the polarization question is it, 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 it's an interesting one, and it, it does seem. I mean, I'm not an expert on this now, in terms of looking across like lots of different countries, so I'm not sure how correct the statement is. But certainly, relative to Britain, so for example, in America, these issues, as you say, have become more and more polarized and more and more identified on a party basis. So even if you go back to like 1980. You had far more ticket splitting. You had far more people who would like vote for a Democrat senator, but then maybe vote for Reagan, right? And you couldn't be as sure by the fact that they voted for Reagan about a whole set of their views as you would be now if someone said I voted for Trump. So it's definitely shifted um, it, 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 over the last 40 years. That, that kind of process hasn't happened in, the, in Britain and I think quite a lot of other European countries in terms of these things being locked into party identities. So there has been educational polarization. That's like a cross Western trend. But that educational polarization is not mapped onto party identification across the West in the same way it has in America. And I don't know what the answer. It's a very interesting question as to why as to why that's different. 
Um, again, like is the does the primary process play some some part of that? Uh, other structural dynamics in the in the American vote system don't know, um, but that is a difference for sure uh, between America and, and Europe and also uh, and also Britain. On that other question, um, I think it comes back to 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 what we've touched on a couple of times, which is just um, the smart people on the right have got out of politics. So if you look at, say, so everyone hates, so on the right, people like me, we hate the New York Times, we hate a whole load of, uh, of, of, like, of that um, uh, liberal media, in quotes, right? But nobody's trying to create an elite thing to take on the New York Times in its own terms. As you say, like a lot of the media... Uh, uh, um, uh, Kind of entrepreneurial activity, like Bannon type stuff, is basically just like trashy. It's not trying to create, it's not trying to like beat the New York Times its own game, which I think someone should try and do. But I think I think a big part of the reason why is is this question of where of where talent's gone. And the left still has a whole load of smart people who are basically on the left going to politics because they want to control these old institutions and they want to tell everyone what to do. Whereas people who are as smart on the right, uh, you know, so you have like two kids now, age twenty. The one who's left inclined wants to go and work with like Larry Summers in Washington, and then work in the U.S. Treasury and tell everyone what to do, and then get rich, good work for Goldman Sachs after some spell in in D.C. Right. Whereas the person who um, uh, has read a lot of Mises and Hayek uh, is probably going to like want to come and work with you guys in, in California on some tech startup, right? Then they go and work for Anduril and combine drones and national security. But when they look around at the people, and this becomes self-reinforcing, when you when, when smart 20-year-old, I mean, I've had this myself in terms of recruiting and looking at things. When you have like very smart kids age 20, 23, and they're looking at options, and they go and look and talk to conservative politicians, like, I don't want to work with these fucking clowns. Like, they just, they they're losers. They're not going to get anything done. They don't really know what they're there for. Uh, why do I want to go and work with those people? So the smart person on the right, the Hayek fan, goes off and does different things. And I think over generations, this this is just compounded and compounded and, uh, and compounded. And it was fascinating, you know, when I after just after we won the election, I wrote a blog. And the blog basically said, OK, we're going to rip up government and we're going to do all of this stuff differently. We're going to break a load of shit and we're going to build a load of new shit. And if you want to do this, if you're a weirdo, if you're a misfit, if you've got technical abilities, but you've like never got involved with politics because it's such a shit show, get in touch and come and help. And I had, I can't remember the exact number now, but like 50,000 people applied for a job. I mean, it was just completely insane. So you can see there is this untapped. There are a lot of people who actually do want to get involved with politics and government who are like non, not people on the left. But at the moment, they're like largely away doing their own things. And they're not going to drop those things to go and work for a conventional conservative thing in Washington or London that they just think is hasn't got an actual plan, couldn't execute anyway, is not going to win. By the way, I was going to ask you about that ad because that, that was pretty famous and went viral at the time. Did you actually hire somebody from, from the 50,000 applicants? We hired some. We had some like o- openly, and we hired some covertly, and got kind of like implanted them in the deep state. Oh wow! <laughs> I, uh, I I love it. I, I want to close by uh, ending, or I want to end by um, returning to where we began, which is on San Francisco. There was one argument earlier that we said, "Hey, tech people don't care about San Francisco." There's the counter argument that that uh, Mark Andreessen has publicly made, uh, who you know came on the show. Um, who whose group chat introduced us, and he said, "Hey, actually, they do care, and they're um, you know, Reed Hoffman, Dustin Moskovitz, um, and other tech people are some of the biggest donors to the DNC, to to the Biden campaign, and um, also to San, in San Francisco politics. They're we're actually we've tech has created the situation that that currently exists. They're, they're and they're relatively happy with it, or they think that's the best that can be done within yeah. the limitations." And that efforts like Gary Tan and, um, you know, others. And, and by the way, Mike Solana is trying to create a right wing New York Times, our, our, our good friend. Um, you know, he's early in, in that. Hopefully he'll he'll be able to do it. But um, yeah, yeah pe- people like Gary Tan, um, while good intentioned, 
um, Mark's argument that he made on our show is that it um, it actually doesn't help because there because there's no Republican Party um, trying to reform just from within the left will further um, incentivize the left to, to keep going crazy and 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 take control. Whereas the only real solution is to let things get so bad that a, that a Republican Party can can emerge. And and no no Gary nobody wants to go right wing. Even eighty percent of Elon of San Francisco is anti Elon. They think he's too you know right wing or beyond the pale. And so we're caught yeah. in, a, in a rock and a hard place, which is: do we just not do anything and wait till things are so bad that a Republican Party can emerge, or can reform happen from within the dem- the, the 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 left? And people like Gary and the others kind of take over, um, despite the sort of structural uh, ratcheting to the most extreme um, that Mark mentions happens in kind of one party cities or states. So it strikes me as as extremely unlikely that there's going to be a Republican in any kind of like short term way, like in the next 10, 15 years or so. Because of other national dynamics, I just can't see. It's a bit like what we're talking about in terms of Israel, Israel and like just moral signals. Like um, the moral signals of the Republican Party are such that it's very hard to imagine a whole bunch of people going, "Oh, yeah, you know, I listen to what they've got to say in San Francisco. The crime's got so bad, maybe we should go Republican." But I don't think that that's going to happen. However bad things get, I can sort of understand um, Mark's argument about the potential futility of trying to reform inside the Democrats. But so my answer to that would be hoping for a Republican revival is doomed certainly in the next 10 years. So um, forget that. Uh, it's perfectly plausible that trying to like have any kind of reform inside the, the Democrat Party isn't going to work. But why are those the only two alternatives? Why can't you build an independent force which doesn't have the branding of either. That's what that's where I would start, and and uh, so I wouldn't try and spend a lot of my time like fighting the internal battle to the Democrat Party because I think a lot of that is a waste of time and, and effort and energy and won't work anyway. If if there is a way through, and there may not be, right? Sometimes like places and cities and cultures are just like they're on trajectory and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, uh, but if there is a way through, I'm sure that it, 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 it's by building something separate to the two parties in San Francisco and say, right, we are San Francisco people. We don't like the Republicans for that reason. We don't like the Democrats for this reason. But here are the things that we believe in and here's what we want to build. And if you put us in power, we'll, here's how we'll fight corruption. Here's how we'll fight crime. Here's how we'll do this. And, you know, you just you, you, you market test a message that, you know, um, at least it works with the, with the voters that you need, and then you try and find some people to 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 sell the message and see 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 what can be built. That's where that's where I that's where I would start. But but the hardest problem I'm sure is going to be people because right, of this chicken and egg problem. The worst the the the, the, the worst the the worst the better only ends up working. You're like when when the real when, when the revolution comes. Until then. <laughs> It just puts everyone off from getting involved. I, and I, I would say the black pill on SF politics we saw very recently, which is that, in fact, SF could be easily cleaned up. So she, I, I'm literally on Second Street in Soma, uh, about a block away from a, high, a highway that typically has a homeless encampment under, under it. And it currently doesn't because Xi Jinping was here and they cleaned up all the streets of San Francisco. Yeah. And practically overnight, practically overnight, the city went yeah. from the dystopia you saw to something else. And I would say... Uh, to quote one of our great American philosophers, H.L. Mencken, uh, democracy is letting the voters choose and then giving it to them good and hard. And yeah. I would say that maybe the Democrats actually want things to be this way because they amplify the problem to which they are the solution, which is, oh, no, there's this drug and homelessness problem and there's this whole theory about it. Like, and they, they could clean it up, but they sort of choose not to. Yeah, I think that that makes a, that makes, um, a lot of sense to me. A lot of California, um, I mean, California Democrat politics is intensely, mainly corrupt. And for people like Newsom, the current thing, I mean, the only way the current thing doesn't work for Newsom is if he actually wants to go and become a national figure. And I think that's an interesting question, right? Because when I was doing all these focus groups last year, one of the interesting things that came up all the time was people saying, like, Democrats or swing voters, not MAGA people would say, 
yeah, you know what? We do need a fucking wall. We need a wall around California. Stop all that crazy shit escaping and washing over the rest of the country. And because you know, they see the the same videos, right? Of like the homeless people like walking around like zombies with machetes in their hands, and they think want the, we don't want this everywhere. Um, and that's a real problem for Newsom, for sure, if he wants to become a national uh, uh, a national figure. But in terms of the internal California politics, maybe the Democrat Party could just be doing this for for a long time, right? You, the, you tech people can like keep insulating yourselves, um, like the Roman senators in the Republic. You can build your build your your walled gardens, the walls of the walled gardens ever higher, and your fish ponds ever more magnificent, and keep the madness out for a, another ten years, maybe. I mean, I, I've always suspected my, my dark theory by way SF is a tech hub is that you need like billion dollar startups to fix some of the problems the city has. And it's actually not even a joke, right? Like the public transport here sucks. So we had Uber. The housing situation, hotels completely sucks. We had Airbnb. Uh, the dating scene, by the way, is terrible. So we had dating apps. The social machine is actually not so great either. So we had all the social media. Like literally every, every great consumer tech sort of innovation you've seen has been kind of a patch to the SF system from very entrepreneurially minded people. <laughs> company to provide personal security with drones is like is the, is the outcome of this right yeah, yeah private right. police is next um before we go starting a new party i presume is very difficult you you don't have the infrastructure that the other parties have you, um if it, if that were so obvious why aren't people do, doing it what, what are the big bottlenecks to, to making that happen I think the, 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 the overwhelmingly the, the biggest bottleneck is just this first past the post problem that you have to get to some critical mass before you can break through, uh, and and it's very hard to persuade people to get involved with with something in a first past the post system because they think well you know I don't want to commit ten years of my life to building this, which may not get threshold where you actually um, where you actually uh, um, can punch through. That's the fundamental. Uh, and I think it's that's why it's like it's overwhelmingly likely that if that's solved, it'll be because someone super duper famous, like global, like legit globally famous character, decides to do it. That's that's the way you could jumpstart it. I don't think the lack of infrastructure. I think actually the lack of infrastructure in lots of ways is actually a great advantage, right? I mean, just in our own experience, because we were a startup in 2016. We just did everything better than the established parties did because we just, you know, we used the cloud. We built all this stuff ourselves. We actually built, had a proper tech team. Um, whereas as soon as we, like, we went in and we took over the Conservative Party, we looked around the infrastructure there. Like the whole thing is just completely rotten and broken and doesn't work. It's like um, a, bit, a bit like central government, actually. You know, like people think this is, can't possibly be true. But when, we, when I arrived in number 10, the Prime Minister of Great Britain has less access to a file sharing system than like a two person startup does. They can at least use Google Docs and like live edit the same document in different parts of, of a building or a hotel or in different parts of the world. The British Prime Minister could not do that. Oh my God. Antonio, you mentioned at the beginning of this call how San Francisco has like an $11 billion budget or, or something like that and yeah. 700,000, 800,000 residents. Do we know how that money is spent? Is that is that public? And if so, are, you know, where is it spent? I mean, I, I assume it's public record. Um, I think the, the corruption is not like literally bags full of cash level of corruption. It's the sort of toadyism of there's all these NGOs, right, that are, you know, NGOs are basically church groups for people who think they're smarter than religion, effectively. And so you have all these NGOs, and it's literally this gravy train in which they throw money at people who make the problems only worse. And, um, you know, I, I forget exactly how much aid you get as a homeless person. Or I think it hovers around eight, 800 to $900 a month. You basically get for free just showing up. And so, I mean, one of the shocking, not shocking things that if you actually talk to homeless people, and there's a few Twitter accounts in which people go out and chat to homeless people, almost none of them are actually from San Francisco. They come from abroad because they know they can get basically get a free ride here. And uh, here, here's a quick, uh, here's a quick uh, job interview question, Dominic. If the aid for the homeless person is $900, what is the average fentanyl dose price in San Francisco per day? Oh, sorry, I didn't go ahead at the beginning of that. that again? <laughs> if, you're, if you show up, if you wash up homeless in San Francisco and you're basically given um, you know, a, a $900 a month cash grant. What's the average cost of a fentanyl dose on the street? I guess net out, right? Like it's basically like 
20 30 dollars a day is what <laughs> that's how much because <laughs> of course it is the market's in equilibrium <laughs> right of course it is so and so yeah i mean i assume this is all public record eric but it's like i don't know i mean the taxes are incredible another thing by the way is a shocking thing just a, a, another random e us eu observation because i i thought when i wrote cast monkeys i actually moved to europe thinking i'd get canceled for other reasons for for writing like this tell-all book and so i like i went spent time in barcelona and berlin and paris like checked out the startup scenes i didn't go to london by the way but it's like europe does everything right to get startups going like literally they'll take over entire buildings and give them to startups they'll have grants there's a lot of talent in europe like they do everything right and then like nothing happens startup wise in the united states they do literally everything wrong top to bottom and yet you, they cannot stop producing tech startups um yeah. it's <laughs> which is incredible but like there's so many taxes here like your your restaurant bill is marked up with some health mandate thing which isn't even a hard number the restaurant can just randomly mark shit up by like five or ten percent which is ridiculous anyhow it's just there, there's there's so much loss and ridiculousness in, in california and yet here we are <laughs> i'm this i'm in san francisco but it, to, to me, the, Twitter is a good analogy where Elon could have started a new Twitter and we have friends who've tried to start a new Twitter and it's, it's very difficult. Network effects are very hard um, and it's it's much easier, although still hard, to take over existing Twitter. And similarly, I went to Miami a couple of years ago thinking that everybody would leave San Francisco and, and also follow. And it turns out no matter how bad it gets, people aren't leaving. And so it's probably a lot easier to move more people to Miami, to San Francisco, than to move yeah. people out of San Francisco into uh, some other city or some other country where you can get some deal with the government, like 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 the whole technology state move, network state movement is trying to do. It's, it sounds kind of like totally plausible, right? Like what what why? Well, but so quickly, the obvious question, like why hasn't this happened before? Why hasn't this happened already? People are scared. I mean, it, of uh, well, well, hold on. So it, I I don't know who you're trying to move here, but so I mean, San Francisco. I was here for the first tech boom. People, shitloads of people moved in. San Francisco, like it's still kind of dead. Like it has not recovered fully from COVID. But like circa 2011, the place you wanted to be in the Western world was within 10 blocks of where I'm sitting right now, which is where every consumer internet company was literally created, right? Like it was happening socially, happening business wise. Everything was here. You felt like you were in the center of the world. This so is that's right. Important. Yeah, this was happening yeah. in AI too. So it, it can happen again. That, that's the opportunity. It I'm could saying. happen. But, but the thing is that people, people either stay and they put down roots and they get woke. Or they make a pile of money and they leave. That's it. Like no one actually invests in San Francisco. That's the problem. Yeah. It might be changing though. There, there, there's a rise in political consciousness in the last few years. Like I know entrepreneurs who are now getting into politics full time um, because they see how how fucked things have gotten here. And um, and there's there's like an ecosystem around it. Um, there's uh, there's it's high status now in a way that it wasn't a few years ago. That's true. Things have changed a little bit, right? You can get Twitter influence by posting about San Francisco politics in a way that. You would never have done ten years ago. Yeah, Max Solana built his whole his whole you know audience off, off that, his media company off that. Um, but, um, if practical campaigns that you guys think like you know so and so is going to try and do something and they're a good guy, then obviously like hook me up. I'd be happy to like look at you know research they're doing or ideas for messaging and stuff like that. If I can help in some way. Cool. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll keep you posted. We, I, I don't know of anything at, at the moment outside of Grow SF, but you're you're in that group chat, and I, I don't think they're they're serious enough, um, but I'd, I'd also be interested. So yeah, we're, we're trying to create that conversation here on the podcast. So let's uh, let's keep the cool. conversation going. But when, when the next governor comes up, maybe we should try and find some like um, legit celeb that we can work with to uh, like The Rock or someone to become governor. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's, it's, been, done, it's been done before. <laughs> Career on, <laughs> arrange it. <laughs> yeah. Bar the mutant vi like virus tryout place, right? So. Let's, let's let's get the rock going in California before we maybe move him into the White House. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, also, Dominic, thanks so much for for coming on. We'll uh, thanks, Dominic. Continue the conversation. Guys, love you to talk.